Okay. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. We continue our 50 Pirates in 50 Days, and right now we are joined by a great pirate, a man who's done a lot for East Carolina University, a great pirate from the state of Georgia. Cecil Staten, everybody, joins us right now on the Sports Objective Podcast. Cecil. <laughs> I'm sorry. You had the wrong number. Actually, we have we have a much better representation of both East Carolina and the great state of Georgia, the one and only friend of the podcast, Mr. Terry Gallagher. Well, I appreciate it. It's always fun to be on here and talk some sports with you guys. And uh, occasionally uh, we talk about most anything. But uh, I'm down here. It's uh, been raining this afternoon. And uh, it goes from hot to rain to humidity to hot to rain to humidity. So, uh, Sounds a lot like Eastern North Carolina, too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so so Terry, uh, you you obviously came to ECU in the mid '70s, played four seasons, uh, very successful years for Coach Pat Dye. Uh, you you led the team in in receptions each of those four seasons. I know, um, I, I guess it's your very first game up up at Appalachian State. Uh, you had three receptions for 218 yards. Yes, folks, that's correct. Three receptions for 218 yards. You finished that season with 33 receptions, and uh, you hold the yards per reception for a single game and uh, also for that season. And then uh, one of your teammates, Billy Ray Washington, that we'll talk a little bit more about later on, uh, holds the um, holds the career mark with nearly 27 yards per reception. But anyway, uh, quite the productive career. And uh, talk a little bit about um, how you got to East Carolina. <laughs> well, I uh- no clue where it was, never heard of it, and had no even no considerations about it. And uh, back then, uh, you could sign for four Christmas. Well, Coach Dye was not hired at East Carolina until uh, during the Christmas break time, and uh, he was still a uh, you know he was still the defensive line uh, coordinator in Alabama, and they were playing in the Orange Bowl, so. It wasn't, uh, he, he was not going to leave Alabama until after the uh, Orange Bowl, which basically meant that East Carolina did not start recruiting uh, some of us or this area until after Christmas, after the first of the year. So uh, it was actually the second, I think, weekend of January of uh, 1974 <laughs> of all times. And, uh, I got a, a call from Frank Orgel. Uh, coach Orgel had been a head coach here in Warner Robins at uh, one of the high schools, and his wife had been my junior high counselor at a, at a junior high school, middle school, back then. And uh, she, uh, she and I, 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 not that I was in trouble a lot, but I needed a lot of guidance. So, <laughs> uh, you heard pretty well, and. So he was watching, he, he was actually coaching at that time. He had gone to Florence State, which is now the University of North Alabama. It's a Division, I think, two school. Right. And has done real well in football. But anyway, Nicky Andrews was a head coach there at the time. He went on to be great defensive coordinator with uh, Florida State. And uh, Coach Jordan was working for him and recruited a bunch of us over there. That's uh, school well. It was soon after that that Coach Dye uh, offered Coach Orgel a job with, with him at East Carolina. Well, see, Frank and uh, Coach Dye were college roommates. So you uh, got that connection, and, and Coach Dye, the uh, first hire he made was to get Coach Orgel and told him to go on up there because, of course, Coach Dye was still involved with Alabama. So Coach Orgel started uh he was the first uh of the new coaching staff to be there and to get things going in greenville and like i said he recruited uh, there were several of us from here in warner robins in this area around macon and uh they flew us up there for the weekend and they took us to a pig picking that i'd never i'd never heard of a pig picking <laughs> had no idea what that was and of course, uh, we were taken downtown, and uh, they showed us around. Uh, we even actually visited the, the school some. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, then on Sunday morning you talk with Coach Dye, then you go back. Well, I can't 
came back, and I'm going, where had I been? <laughs> I still, and nobody here do anything about East Carolina. So, uh, of course, I signed the uh, scholarship, and I was actually coached out his first weekend of recruits, his first full weekend of recruits at East Carolina. And uh, out of the 30 freshmen, now I think they actually signed 26 that year, uh, maybe six of us made it through four years. And wow. So it was uh, it was not for everybody. Did, uh, did you have a chance to go anywhere else, Terry? <clears throat> My only other offer for football was at Wake Forest, of all places. Wow. So, uh, and they had come off of uh, 0-11. Back then it was 11 games scheduled. Right. Uh, and they, they were 0-11, and, and, uh, but I did get flown up there and spend the weekend. And uh, it wasn't very big. I remember that. I don't but, think you uh, would have been a good fit for White Forest in those days. Well, uh, I, when I went to East Carolina, the first thing they told me was that it was a former, you know, it, was, it used to be all girls and uh, yeah. and uh, the nursing and uh, education, you know, were two of the big uh, fields of study. So uh, cool. there were about 70% female at that time. Well, I had a chance. I could go play in a football team that was 0-11, but had hardly any students on the campus. Or I could go to East Carolina, who I had never heard of, but I had 70% female. <laughs> Good choice, Terry. Good so, choice. naturally, looking for the out for the future, I uh, chose East Carolina. Uh, and, and so, like I said, it was really, I didn't have many uh, opportunities. So. Anyway. Off that, Terry, uh, you mentioned all the lovely ladies in East Carolina with 70% female population, and uh, you make the decision to come here, and, and, and that proved to be a smart decision for you in your personal life, because your wife is also a pirate. Absolutely. I wound up meeting her, and uh, uh, she's from Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, Gail, it was Morris at the time, and uh, uh, she was uh, downtown playing foosball. Any of y'all remember that? playing foosball downtown, yeah. and uh, uh, Les Trahorn and I were good friends. And, you know, Les, he's, he's another one you might want to get on And uh, for 50-50. Uh, Les had played in the early 70s. That was Kenny Strayhorn's older brother. And Les uh, wound up playing for the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, he was a uh, real good uh, running back himself. And... Uh, so anyway, Les, Les and I had gone downtown, and uh, he introduced me to this uh, this young lady, and uh, Miss she was named Gail, and I had a ponytail at the time because uh, that was between my senior years. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, that was because and, Coach, Coach Dye begged you to grow one, right? Well, that's because I didn't think I was going to be playing anymore. And uh, once I was told I was going to be playing, uh, what I would do is anytime I was around Coach Dye, I'd have it uh, in a hat. I'd, I'd put the ponytail and bundle it up and put it underneath the hat. I like the dude in the yeah. song signs. Yeah, so yeah, I that. made sure I didn't have any hair showing when I was around him. Terry, <laughs> yeah, like the, you know the song the signs one. there, Terry? You like the guy that song. <laughs> Right. So, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, oh, you, you mess up my thought. Uh, okay. That's a uh, concussion syndrome. You make so, it. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so we're, uh, we go down there and, uh, she, uh, had ever seen, uh, she, you know, I was kind of, uh, unique in that I was not, didn't really look like a college football player. Uh, right. You know, my physique and size wasn't overwhelming and all. And uh, so I was uh, oftentimes asked if I need the gallery to play football. <laughs> 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 and I'd tell him, I'd say, yeah, yeah, I know him. I'd, I'd said, no, I don't know it, but I've heard he's a real jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so anyway, we wound up uh, meeting and, and I. That was just kind of the thing, and then that's where I met her. Then uh, over the next few weeks, months, whatever, we really, uh, it wasn't an overnight love affair. It was about a two-year deal, and then we started actually seeing each other. And, uh, but 39 years later, we're still together. So. 
Uh, a I pirate have, love story. And the, the, and the, the, the see, it's always pirates having pirates. And, right. uh, pirates supporting pirates. There you go. And uh, so anyway, that's how that happened. So yeah, it was a good uh, good decision. Now, uh, going up there, though, never, people down here never did. And still, in, in a lot of ways, I guess, don't understand uh, what East Carolina really is. And so uh, they thought I was playing at a at like a you know small community college or something, and uh, people just really the, the respect down here is uh, very high. I guess I should say. If it ain't Georgia or Georgia Tech or somebody in the SEC, they don't yeah, care. That's that's exactly right. And they can't whatever you say or do. It just don't you know. You didn't really play the major you know major college football. So, but anyway, that's okay. Uh, I'm a pirate, and I wave. Of course, it's been tough, but I have got all my stuff back out, and we're getting ready for the fall, and uh, you will see purple and gold here in Little Georgia, and it won't be LSU. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think I think you have something to be proud of this year. Um, what are, you, what are your thoughts on – you had a chance to meet Mike Houston at, at the Independence Bowl party back in December to celebrate the 40th anniversary of you guys winning the Independence Bowl. Uh, you had a chance to meet Mike Houston. I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to him any more since then. Uh, what do you think of Mike Houston? Are you keeping up with the practice reports posted by the Sports Objectives? And uh, what are your thoughts? It seems the practice has been a lot more physical. Well, I, I think you can just uh, – haven't spent time with, with Coach Houston, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't think many people have because all I can, uh, all I know is he's been working since day one. When he first got the job, he hit the ground running and has been going ever since. So uh, they did have a little time off, I think, in June. He and the coaches, uh, and, I, you know, that's generally the time college coaches and all, uh, even high school, you a little time off and yeah, he went on a cruise so him and his wife and kids went on a cruise well that's great and uh and all but once they got back it's hitting the ground running again and uh and i i, I do pay attention that's easier with uh communications like it is now than it used to be even 10 years ago but uh so there for a long time it was hard for me to ever know much about what was going on up there and certainly while i was working i didn't right. have to to because uh, I was busy with uh, you know football and all myself, so uh, uh, you know it was. Uh, uh, it, it seems to me that he's gone in and just basically uh, he he's he's changed the entire atmosphere. And I know people like to use the word culture today. You know, it's uh, changing the culture. Well, I know one thing. He's had an attitude adjustment. Uh, you can call it that. Uh, but but um, they're, they are much more, uh, ex- put it this way, they are they're going to be more physical. They're going to be more uh, uh, working. They're going to be more of a team. And they're going to uh, obviously expect to win when they step on the field. I, I can tell you, I, I got something to ask you. Uh, Yesterday after the scrimmage, he said one of the things he was disappointed with was the intensity at times and right. the lack of intensity and urgency. Right. And he also talked about, which is generally perceived as a positive, the lack of penalties. Well, that was something the last few years we've been penalized very little. And I've kept saying, I think part of the reason we're not penalized very much is because there's no, there's not a lot of want to there. There's not a lot of urgency. To me, a lot of penalties is because you're trying hard. Uh, no. Now, not stupid penalties, but, you know, if, if you ain't holding, you ain't trying. That, that kind yeah. of thing. And I wonder if, if you – do you kind of agree with that? You don't want to get penalties. But sometimes when you're seeing an abnormal the other way, when you're seeing, like, no penalties, mm-hmm. can that mean you just – do guys ain't, ain't, don't care as much and they're not giving as much effort? Well, uh, you know, the thing – okay, with penalties, Coach Dye always told us that uh, – uh, when, when, there, when it got to be game time, there was only one thing that we were responsible for. Everything else, uh, it, you know, anything that wasn't right, it was uh, the coaches and him uh, was responsible for, except penalties, and that was us. 
He said, now, uh, and we got, we had some punishment for penalties, but, uh, uh, the thing was, there's, there's, a, there's stupid penalties, there's procedural penalties, then there's effort penalties. Yes. And again, now, effort penalties, we'll get over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that, that, it, I'd much rather have to tone a guy down than have to turn him back up. Exactly. And it's like with these race car drivers. If you ain't got a guy driving, uh, like, you know, like he's the only car out there and he's wanting to win, uh, you know, if you got a guy that's, that's comfortable with third or fourth place, well, uh, there's a problem. Because yeah. uh, you can always tone it back. But I, I, I like a guy that, that, that gets so pissed at that D lineman, you know, getting to that quarterback. That, Damn it, I'm going to hold him. I ain't going to let him buy. Or, or, or a guy that don't want to get beat on that deep ball, so he goes and mugs yeah. that wide receiver. I like somebody that's got a little bit of that in him. Hey. Well, for different it, – it, with me, and, and again, it's different – Different uh, things for different positions and different players and their personalities. And uh, uh, but the, you know the thing about it is, uh, like Harold, uh, we had Harold Randolph at linebacker, and uh, he uh, was physical to say the least. And but he was physical, not always in a in a good way. And so of course we would get penalties. Well. It wasn't the penalties that hurt us the most by him and his uh, disposition on the field. Uh, we would have to tone him down because he was getting the other team fired up. <laughs> <laughs> he, we tell him, you know, quit, uh, you know, back, you know, the don't quit. You know, you're you're getting them, you know, you're getting them going, and, and uh, that's a, you know, back it up a little bit. Those, yeah. uh, you know, little things you can do uh, between the whistles. Now, here's one thing with me. Uh, from the time the ball snapped until the whistle blows, that's when everything happens. Yes. When that whistle blows, if you get a penalty after that whistle, that's Very your good. penalty, and that's stupid. Very with you 100%. That is a, yeah. it, it's a selfish penalty, uh, and, and there's no place for it. So if you if you're gonna play more from the time the whistle blows until the ball snapped, then there's a problem because yeah. we we need to be playing from the time the ball snapped until the whistle blows. Yeah, th th I agree with you 100. <laughs> percent Hey Kyle, uh, Kyle and Terry, think back uh, almost two years ago now that season opener in 2017 against James Madison. Uh, remember in that first half. Um, JMU was controlling that ball game, but it was only a 7 nothing game. And a lot of times um, we would have receivers where it looks like they were going to have uh, – they are going to get behind the JMU secondary, uh, but their their secondary was smart, and they got pass interference probably four yep. or five times when, when they were beat. Yep, exactly. Effort penalties, making sure yeah, you'd rather get the penalty than give up the home run ball. It, it, well, it, yeah. It, it, that, and that's knowing that's knowing uh, that's knowing the game and uh, using the rules to your benefit. What's uh, what's better, a thirty-yard completion or a fifteen-yard penalty? Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, I, I coached the secondaries for a lot of years. Uh, uh, of course, it was high school, but still, uh, if I had a, a kid that or uh, played against a guy who was a really great receiver and we had trouble with him, and knew he was going to get behind us. Then yes, what we were going to do was we're going to run with him, and we're going to run so that we're going to force him out of bounds. And so if he does catch it deep, it's going to be over there on their bench. Now that's going to probably get a, get get you a penalty. <laughs> Martha, but uh, that was much better than him catching that touchdown pass. Because if you keep if you keep teams uh, from having twenty yards or more. Uh, uh, plays uh, every every twenty plus yards play you give up. Uh, you know that's gonna that's gonna be the downfall of the defense. So uh, fifteen yards we can live with. Now yeah. if it's if it's out of foul, then then you know we're gonna have to do it different. But but not with that. Uh, so talk, uh, talk, guys, talking about our defense, uh, 
last year for I guess probably about two thirds of the season, maybe three quarters of the season, we we showed fairly significant improvement considering how bad we had been. Uh, we did a lot better job of getting pressure on the passer. Um, we sacked the quarterback 34 times. I think Nate Harvey had like 14 and a half of those, and unfortunately he was unable to get that extra year. Um, but so even you take those out of there, 20 sacks um, by everybody else, that was that was still more than we had combined for in 2016 and 2017. Um, so David Blackwell, unfortunately, just poor timing, and um, he wasn't able to see things through. Um, but although we were better against the run and we were better at getting pressure on the, pressure on the quarterback, uh, we still did not force many turnovers whatsoever. And I was kind of looking at um, my Phil Steele magazine earlier today five consecutive years that we have lost uh, the, the turnover battle for the season and the last three years under Scotty Montgomery it's been minus 10 or worse La last year it was minus 14 all has got to start bouncing our way to be sure uh, did you say last year was minus 14 minus right. minus 14 for the season and then I think uh, one year it was minus 10 and then the other year it was minus 16. That's, what you're doing is uh, that, that minus means you're giving them the ball that many more times a game uh, than you have it. So uh, if I'm only going to have the ball eight times and you get the ball 12 times, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's what a turnover does. And and going for it on first fourth down and not making it, that's a turnover. Yeah. That's and also, yeah, on the defensive side of the ball, we're not forced. We haven't been forcing any. And to me, they, to me, that goes back to, hey, you know, if you guys play the game, it goes back to effort. Intensity and effort. And uh, you were talking earlier about what Coach uh, Houston had said in terms of their intensity at practice. Well, you got to look at it. Uh, okay, the first week of practice in the fall is honeymoon. You know, that's your honeymoon time. Everybody's happy to be here. Everybody's got great ambition. You know, we're going to all, we're all zero and zero. Yeah. Everybody's fresh. Uh, things are lovely. Now, we've been practicing how long now? We, we've uh, been practicing we, for just over a week. Just over a week. So we're getting in the, you, you're starting, plus you're putting pads on for the first time. Or, or, you know, you just started putting the pads on. Yeah, we just had our uh, first scrimmage Saturday. Okay. And then, so that, that's, that's still going to have a little bit of the uh, freshness. Uh, so it's not as bad as it's going to be. But what starts happening is you, you start, uh, you know, that's when, uh, that's when you start having to, uh, that's when the first, that's when a player becomes a tough, you know, a tough player. It's is uh, when this time hits, and now you're sore, you you you're hurt, you know you got some ba uh, bumps and bruises, and uh, uh, you know it, it's here and, right. and it's going on. So it, it ain't quite the same now. How how hot was it? <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how hot it was yesterday, Terry. I know uh, Coach Houston said it was a beautiful day for football and he did allude to the fact that there was a, a bit of a breeze so I, I, I don't think it was as hot as it has been a, a lot of last week I, kind, of, kind of along the lines of what you're saying I do know that coach Houston was talking about that how um, after things had not gone very well one day and then and then there had also uh, you know gotten beat up a little bit and he said how are we going to respond and um, and and just very much the same thing you just said. Well, because it, it, you get into the doldrums where you know you, you just you're, uh, you you think you're giving the effort, you think you're going full speed, you know you're really attempting to do that, but it's not there uh, because you're having to fight through some other things, adversities, and as far as you know, just getting used to uh, practicing all that again and. So it's, it's these times when you start finding out who your bell cows are, uh, you know, the guys that, that people are going to rally around. 
uh, leadership. That's where the leadership starts being built. Like Jerry Jones says, a leader. we got to have a leader. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. I mean, and, and that's how that's how you, you build leaderships, and, and you build leadership, and, 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 and you are, I mean, guys are going to recognize who the leader. You can't say this guy's a leader. No, right. the, the guys are going to follow the leader. And uh, you, you got to be. The guys will recognize who leads, and then I think, then I think the coaching staff has to put that guy in the right situation to make sure guys rally around him. Well, well, that they, that that's you know that's a huge part of it, and and that, that's the off season. That's why you work so hard in the off season is to make sure you get your personnel where they're best fitted and what's best fitted for your team. Uh, but you know, you, I go back to what I was saying. Now you you. This, this is the time here where you don't back off uh, and, and you don't uh, you don't make it easier for them and you don't necessarily make it tougher but you just make sure that you uh, are pushing through and and this is the uh, and also a team build this is a good time for team build because uh, you know you, you do things as a team even if it's running sprints after practice. Uh, do you, do, not, you don't want to always do everything individually. Do you do, you do something at some point during, during during practice, during the doldrums? You know, when you get about the middle part of fall camp, you know, you coached high school ball and you played college ball and you, and you, and you, and you had a cup of coffee in the CFL. Were, were you ever around or did you ever do as a coach something like in the middle of practice, all the kind of surprise kids have to do something fun one day? Uh, oh yeah, you come up with all anything that the, the different coaches. You again, you don't you don't do it all the time, but uh, you might have a coach uh, 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 like like uh, give you an example. I was listening, of course, uh, uh, NFL Hall of Fame weekend. Uh, I forget I forget who the coach was, but uh, he 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 uh, the NFL player uh, is a Hall of Fame member. And he also coaches with Herm Edwards at, uh, I think it's Arizona State now that he's yeah, there. Right, right. Arizona State, yep. And, uh, and, and so uh, the Monday after he got back from that weekend, uh, he, he said he went out on the field. He said, everything I had on was gold. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he, he wore his NFL gold jacket. He, he had on gold shoes, gold socks, gold belt. Uh, and, and, you know, with his jacket and comes out to practice with his uh, NFL Hall of Fame jacket. <laughs> so, so, yeah, things, just things to, uh, uh, you know, again, it's not to entertain them or anything else, it, but it's lighting things up. It's, and it's to show, you have to sometimes show the kids how to be leaders. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you don't do it by... Uh, jumping in front and making them do counts. Hey, what you do, you, and this is the way I see it anyway, and I think Coach Houston uh, does things the, the, kind of like this, and, and, and it's that you want to you wanna set the table more or less for them on how to take the bit and how to run with it. And so by coaches doing things like that, then, you know, a, a player will wind up maybe doing something. That's a little bit different, and, and just even if it's getting out there and the, everything's hot and everybody's dragging, and then somebody gets out there and starts dancing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and it, it's, as long as it's the guy that's backing up what he's doing, then then that's that's where you find that's that's your leader, because you know he's he's not only uh, taking care of himself, but he's concerned about his brothers. So he's taking the initiative to try to do something to pick him up. And that's what a leader does. Uh, you know, it's not always you follow, you follow. It's, uh, you know, we got to show you how to follow. And, and then we got to be good leaders. So, so it's a combination of things there. But this is a, this is a great time uh, now for us to, uh, to, uh, hopefully, and, and see, here's the thing why we can't expect miracles. Uh, we're talking about three years that it took us to get into this problem. Well, you're not going to get out of a three-year 
problem in one or two weeks or months. Or even uh, one season. Or even one, yeah, right. Now, what I look for, a successful season, for me, this year, is that every game we play, the other team knows we were in it. You know, uh, the score will take care of itself. If we if we go out and play hard, if we give effort, if we're making the other team beat us, then then I, I'm a, I'm okay. Just because you lose on the scoreboard don't mean you're a loser, unless right. you let it unless you let it make you a loser. Because uh, uh, the thing about it, you you got to uh, there comes a point where you know you you got to do something different. You can't just keep going uh, one direction, and I don't, I don't see that happening here uh, with with this group of coaches that we have. Speaking of the group of coaches, Terry, um, there's one of them you know very well. You've been friends with Steve Shankwiler for a long time. Talk about your relationship with Shank and just your thoughts on him and him coming back to East Carolina. Oh, uh, Shankwiler was uh, when I when I finished in nineteen. Uh, I finally graduated. Uh, got my uh, look. It was nineteen. I'm trying to be uh, nineteen eighty. It would be the summer of nineteen eighty when I finally finished school. Now you remember, I got there in seventy four. So, yeah. Uh, so your doctor Terry Gallagher. I took the full advantage of my uh, time there at ECU. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I, I finally, I, I, my first uh, job, uh, since I didn't have much money and all, I needed to go to, go to work. And uh, so I had to get a real teaching job. And uh, uh, I got one in Georgia up in the Atlanta area, up on the northeast side of Atlanta around Stone Mountain. And uh, I was at a school, Tucker High School. In fact, that's where Dwayne Harris came from. Yep. Uh, Dwayne, uh, of course, I, he's uh, he'd watch uh, Hard Knocks. Uh, he was Oakland Raiders this year, and uh, I saw Dwayne on there the first episode. Uh, but anyway, uh, Thunder High School, and come to find out, um, there was a local school, well, another school in the, it's, it's DeKalb County is where I was at. And DeKalb County at that time had 22 or so high schools in the county. Uh, it was the largest school system in Georgia, I believe, at that time. Since then, it's passed that. The uh, more, the farther out counties around Atlanta are the big ones now. But uh, anyway, Coach uh, Shankweiler was the head football coach at Avondale High School, which, uh, you know, was, again, in our area. And I'm, I just met him through uh, going to things or being around uh, athletic things in the county. And, um, he left there and went to the Citadel. Was his, I think that was his first college job. And uh, but but he would always recruit, uh, come back and recruit that area. But, uh, and usually I was in the area of Georgia that he recruited in. So uh, just through the years we we got to know each other pretty well. And then of course he wound up in East Carolina. And, he left East Carolina, then he wound up at East Carolina, and then he left East Carolina, and then he wound up at East Carolina. <laughs> and the thing I love about Coach Shane is he did not have to come here this time. And and I really think it's kind of – and that shows you what kind of guy he is, that he's, he's really a winner. He's got the pirate attitude because he wanted to come back to East Carolina a fourth time. And uh, I thought, had it not been rough and get the job, of course, you know, he was my teammate. Uh, I would really like to have seen Coach Shankwiler be the head coach uh, when when Ruffin got hired. But, of course, uh, things went the way they did, and the uh, rest is history. But Coach Shank, is, uh, is, uh, he, he cares about the school. He, he really enjoys being there. Uh, he likes the area, and uh, this time all the kids are grown and all that type of stuff, so uh, it's a little different for him, and uh, I think we're very fortunate to have him. Uh, he's, that, you got to figure he's got uh, at least, you know, he's got 40 years worth of coaching experience. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, you know, then you look at our def- uh, what the defense coordinator, uh, Bob uh, Trot. He, he coach Trot. Uh, he coached. Uh, he was he was a graduate assistant at North Carolina when I was playing. Yeah, wow. Because he was he was a graduate assistant with uh, for, for Buddy Curry, uh, who played at Carolina, then played for the Falcons. Uh, I do some some of these football camps with him and. Uh, uh, he was he was asking me about Coach Trey. He was telling me that uh, he was there when when he was playing. So uh, you're looking at 40 or so years experience. Uh, geez, Donnie Kirkpatrick, uh, how many years has he got? Uh, you have yeah. quite a few, quite a few. Yeah, we're over hundred Yeah, we're over a hundred years coaching experience already. Yeah, and that's not counting Mike Houston. Exactly. You know, now, uh, I don't, we never, I don't think we ever had uh, that type of experience uh, over the last three years. No, not over the last three years. No, not even not even a fraction thereof. No. Um, so, I mean, you, you, we got we got two or three guys that are assistants that I would have rather had as head coach over Scotty Montgomery. And, uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, that's just being honest. So, I mean, I, I I think we're in good hands, and I'm looking forward to the season. Um, Terry, I wanted to ask you, I mentioned earlier about your cup of coffee in the CFL. Talk about that, about your experience in the Canadian Football League and your relationship now with some people in the CFL. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how that went. Uh, it was uh, after my second senior season was uh, fall, uh, you know, fall of 78. So it would be the uh, summer of 79, spring of 79. Um, Coach uh, Trevathan actually uh, helped give me the uh, the chance to go up there. Uh, I went as a free agent to Ottawa. And uh, back then, I actually signed a contract for about $25,000. Now, I know people say today, $25,000? That ain't nothing, you know. No, no, no. This is 1979, and uh, minimum wage. You know, I, I don't even know if it was. Yeah, if you take the inflation calculator, twenty-five thousand seventy-nine would probably be. It would probably be about eighty thousand today. That's just yeah. off the top of my head. Eighty to a hundred, yeah. Yeah, yeah, about like that. Uh, because American uh, players got paid more than Canadian players. Right. So, so they were considered skilled athletes more so than the Canadians. Um, and it, of course, again, this was back then. Uh, you only had 15 Americans on the team. You, you couldn't have uh, a team full of Americans. They had limits. Uh, they still do today. They still do, yeah. Uh, but it's a little bit different the way they do the numbers. But it's still less than a. It, it's it's about a third of the team. Only about a third or so of the team. Maybe a little more now can be uh, American. So uh, when I got up there, uh, it, everybody, when you, when, once you reach up, and I know people think the CFL is not anything, uh, but it, it, it is the same as the NFL. It's just they don't pay the same, and, uh, and the rules are different, and you play with 12 men on the field instead of 11. But it's, it's every bit what the NFL is because, uh, in fact, several guys I played with when I was up there uh, went on back and did play in the NFL. And uh, I just, uh, once I got cut, I just made my decision to, uh, to go and uh, try to finish and get my degree and see if East Carolina would uh, help me out. And Coach Dine, uh, I went ahead and uh, started uh, into a coaching career. But uh, that's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily what everybody does, but uh, 25000 was not too bad of money, so I decided I'd go up there. Well, I didn't really know all the details about, you know, the fine print for stuff. <laughs> it was Canadian dollars. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, well, I, I don't know what it is today. Back then, it was about a... Uh, I guess a dollar, American dollar was about a a dollar twenty for Canadians. Okay. You know, and uh, I don't know what how it works today, but and, and you know, uh, Canadian money is uh, like monopoly money. 
uh, it's different colors and it's like a little wider, a little bigger. The paper money. And uh, of course, the coins are real. It's like they're made out of, uh, I don't know, it's real light. They're like a, a slot, like one of them token coins. Yeah. 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 But uh, so the different colors, it just, you know, it makes it fun if you go out and start having a few beverages and all, and you start. Just, here, take this color. <laughs> and let's, let's do what we can for this color. <laughs> uh, it's a little different, but uh, but it was definitely a culture shock. Uh, I drove up there, and uh, I went across the border around, uh, uh, it was the uh, central part of New York State, and it was called uh, Thousand, Thousand Islands. Was the region it was it was in, and it's right there. Salad right. dressing. Yeah, that's what I always kept thinking. It was Lake Ontario, I think, or yeah. no, or anyway, it was the farthest east of Lake of the Great Lakes. It was right where it starts into the St. Lawrence River. Okay, so, so beautiful, beautiful area, and uh, uh, the whole, the, all of it, all of Canada is so much cleaner than America, but, uh, but uh, I got up there, so I get across the border, and I get on the Queens Highway, which is uh, like the main interstate that goes east to west across Canada, and uh, I saw a sign, and the first thing I see is speed limit, 100. Kilometers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this was in the time when we were having the gas, uh, it was called the gas crisis, and they were uh, even odd days. Yeah, rising and gas. Yeah. So uh, you had all that going, and gas had jumped uh, from like fifty or sixty cents a gallon up to you know dollar fifty here. We were thinking that was crazy. Uh, well, I get up there and I, and I see a sign that uh, it says gas, uh, and it got it says something like uh, eighty cent. You know, I'm going, wow, this is great. Let's pull over, fill up. Uh, they sell it by the liter. <laughs> <laughs> 80 cents a liter, so it was twice as much as American plus. Right. Yeah. So anyway, it took a lot of pain. And also, Ottawa is um, uh, the capital of Canada, so it's, it's right on the uh, border. And there's a river that separates uh, Ottawa from uh on uh, Ottawa, Ontario, from Quebec, and there's a city there called it's called Hull, H U L L, Quebec, and um, you know Quebec is French speaking. Correct. Yeah. So, so uh, Ottawa, everything in Ottawa was um, in both uh, English and French. So if you saw a, like a stop sign, it'd have both words on it. Uh, so you know it was. Uh, People spoke fluently uh, both languages. Little kids, little kids would run up to you, you know, asking for an autograph or something. They, they're, uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, yeah. So you felt kind of, uh, it really, it makes you wonder why people in America are so, why, you know, what's the problem with it, learning other people's languages? Because, uh, you know, it actually makes you look smarter if you know more than one language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard a great quote the other day. The next time you get aggravated with uh, with somebody foreign trying to speak English and not doing it well, keep in mind they know one more language than you do. Think about it. And, and I did. Uh, I, was, uh, I found out I had a southern accent when I got to Canada. <laughs> so uh, it was uh, people would... would if I went out to eat, they'd want to come listen to me order. <laughs> hey, listen to this. Come here. Hey, listen to this guy talk, eh? <laughs> you, was it hard to find good barbecue uh, up in Ottawa at the time? Uh, I didn't see much barbecue. or didn't have a pig picking. There wasn't no pig picking up there. It's, uh, uh, I, we, we talked to, um, oh, God, I'm terrible with names. Bubba, help me out. The heat coach is up there. Um, Biscuit, yeah, biscuit. Devon Claybrook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he said. He said. Uh, where's he at now? Uh, Vancouver. He's Columbia. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. Vancouver. So uh, yeah, he said. Uh, he said that there, uh, there, 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 there is a good barbecue restaurant uh, up there now. You know, things have changed over the years. So yeah, his restaurant. <laughs> hey, we have his own restaurant. 
Yeah. Hey, were, were, there any, were there any right. Tim Hortons back then? Yeah. What's that? I was just picking. I said, and, and I, I may be mistaken on this. I said, but uh, I said, were there any Tim Hortons back then? You know, uh, the, 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 the I was picking about the chain of restaurants. Oh, no. I don't think, I think Tim Hortons might have still been playing at that time, uh, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> Got to remember now. I'm, I'm a little bit older than y'all, so. Uh, but uh, that's the most popular chain of restaurant in uh, in, in uh, Canada, uh, Terry. If you want to wait on that here. Okay, okay, I got you. It's like, uh, it's like hey, uh, a donuts kind of place. Oh, okay. For, for whatever reason, up there it's more popular than McDonald's. Uh, hey. Hey, and, hey. and Terry, that more, more that popular, name hey. that name Tim Horton always just sticks with me. I, I, think about that chain of restaurants because we have a good friend tim horton who had been the, the longtime uh, running backs coach and recruiting coordinator at auburn on gus malzahn staff and gus, oh, yeah. gus let him go he's yeah. now he's now at vanderbilt that was that right yeah. tim horton's okay. restaurant was named after was an nhl player uh uh-huh. right, yeah i'm learning all kind of things tonight we thought you knew canada uh um, well but the thing is, uh, Canada has never had, uh, I think, the same number of teams now than they, that they've had. Uh, I really can't think of when they've added uh, they They tried to expand into America in the early 90s. Yeah, uh, right. And that didn't work, and they went like, back to what they were doing. So, yeah. Yeah, it didn't. Didn't go real good, but uh, and and the thing about it, that you know, again, their con their salaries are less than the uh, American NFL, and their uh, coaches make less. Uh, I have a friend up there. Well, actually, my friend Chris Jones, who was the he was the head coach at Saskatchewan, and he was also the general manager the last few years, and uh, he just he got hired in the off season at Cleveland with the Cleveland Browns. Uh, he was a graduate assistant at Alabama when Freddie Kitchens was playing at Alabama. And he and Freddie had stayed friends through the years and uh, had said whoever got the first one got a job in the NFL uh, could hire him, but, you know, the other one would do it. So, uh, so Chris is with uh, uh, Freddie Kitchens at Cleveland now. But uh, he was one I had, uh, you know, Wanted to give a chance to at East Carolina, be the head coach at East Carolina because uh, he would have he would have got a his contract at East Carolina would have been more than what he was making in Canada, so it would have been a step up in salary for him. And uh, he was wanting to come back to the state anyways from Tennessee, old country boy, and uh, no, but uh, but anyway, he he uh, has been there, and I guess with my having been up there through the years, I. Maintain a different attitude about the CFL than people, uh, most people on the periphery, uh, because I see it as, as much as, uh, I, I ain't going to say it's better than the NFL, but I'll say that it's uh, as equal uh, with this game because it's a uh, wider field and stuff like that. You know, it'd be interesting to see an NFL team play a, a real NFL, a CFL game. You know, I, 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 I was 
went to practice. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to kill these old guys, you know. Hey, go. And I'm out there hustling around and all, and they just kind of walked around. But i tell you what they do. When the ball snapped until the whistle blows, they play 100% grown man football. <laughs> yeah, speaking of 100% and blowing the whistle, this podcast is giving 100%. And Bubba, I think I just heard the whistle blow. It's time to wrap it up. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, it's one of those uh, school nights, so getting, re- getting ready uh, to get the kids ready for, for the first full week. Uh, but we've really enjoyed it, Terry. Um, it's hard to believe that opener, the opener, excuse me, is uh, three weeks or was three weeks from yesterday. So looking forward to the Pirates venturing up to Raleigh. And I, I know it's going to be much more competitive this time around, to, to say the least. And, and who knows, maybe, maybe we'll just pull it off. Absolutely. I think uh, whatever happens, it will definitely be, uh, we'll be able to say we're proud to be Pirates and that, you know, ECU is uh, playing ECU football. Absolutely. Thank you, Terry. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. <laughs> That's perfect timing. Leave the dog in, Bubba. Yep. Yep. <laughs>